Father God, we come before you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Lord, for allowing us to be here. Um, thank you for giving us things to do in your kingdom. Things to, we get to gather and we get to serve with you, Lord. We get to be in your house. We get to, we get to be busy about our Father's business. So, Lord, I pray that you bless us here today. I pray that you send your Holy Spirit to feed your sheep today and feed your lambs and equip your saints for words of service. Bless us and uh, help us as we worship. Send the angels to sing with us. And we just thank you for all your blessings on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Some
already built fly. Mm -hmm. Good. Surrender. 
You're worthy of every good thought we could think, Lord. Thank you so much for blessing us here this morning. Pray that, Lord, you uh, continue to meet us in your throne room. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's time to get down. Steve Those are talk this This is a time of just preach the Lord, lift up his name to just praise him and glorify him. So Do you mind starting us off here, Steve? And are you able to just praise the Lord? And I'll also close the Lord with you. So. Lord, we uh, just thank you uh, for your word today. Uh, our talks about your mercies and your love and kindness are new every morning. Um, and that's uh, certainly, certainly true today. We are so grateful for the blood of Jesus. Lord, that we can have the power of a clear conscience because of your work on the cross. And Lord, we all know we need that just every day. And so we praise you that it is a new morning, it's a new day. Lord, that you have um, works of righteousness for us to walk in, that we're in the very beginning of the world. And we know, Father, we cannot do that uh, by our own power or that, but only by your strength and your grace and your power. And so we just thank you that we can gather this Worship your name and prepare us, Father, for the ministry that you will have for us this week. And again, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for the wonder of your love, your goodness, and your mercy, and your forgiveness. Goodness. Good truth and great comfort. You are always comfort. We just thank you for all the blessings that you pour out in our lives, that you care and have for us. We thank you for the, the beauty of the springtime. Sounds of the birds and the sunshine and the warmth and the rain, the ways that you pour out blessing on our very physical body as well as in our, in our lives and our hearts. In Jesus' name. Lord, our Lord, how much 
Majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens for the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies. Silence the foe of evil. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the salt, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You make them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Bless your name this morning, O Lord. We just thank you for your word. We thank you for, for songs of, of worship that we can sing to, to bless you, O Lord. Lord, you're, you're worthy of all our, our worship and honor. O Lord, uh, surrendering to you is just opening peace and freedom to be all we can be the way you created us to be, O Lord. We just thank you for that. Amen. Just thank you. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, most high, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. <laughs> and Father, I want to thank you because we were built to give you glory, to be able to, be able to give you praise and thanks. We are the work of your hands, Lord. You have made each one of us in your image, Lord, and I just want to thank you that regardless of what happened, Father, to those who know you, to those who accepted your Son, you have given eternal life, Father. You have imparted your Son's righteousness upon us, not because of anything we've done, but just because of the work that you've done, the work that your Son has done. And Father, I want to thank you your promises are beyond understanding. Your promise is so great, it's just a, it is just many times beyond our understanding. But at the same time, we also know that you have the power, the authority, the jurisdiction, Lord, in all of these things to make all of your promises come true, Lord. And Father, I just want to thank you for all these things through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You are so good to me. You heal my broken heart. You are my Father in heaven. You are so good to me. You heal my broken heart. You are my Father in heaven. You are beautiful, sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You're so beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. I will sing it. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so uh, it made me think of Colossians chapter 3, where it encourages us to take off the old man and put on the new man, renewed in Christ. And so this song is uh, a song pretty old. I thought it was a new song, and then uh, <laughs> some friends of ours uh, from the bluegrass realm, they said, oh no, we were singing this song when we were in Sunday school many years ago. I thought, well, that's a, I didn't say it to their face, but I said, that's a long time. <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, you can stand with us if you'd like. I'm 
walk out the door determined to follow through with our Father's instructions and allow you, Lord Jesus, to keep building your church. This is your church. Keep building us. In Jesus' name, everyone said? Amen. 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 You may be seated if you're not seated already. <laughs> Looks like uh, they had a successful Living History Days. Did you guys have a successful Living History Days yesterday? Amen. And then I was over visiting Glennon while he was uh, working the blacksmith's station, you know, poking him. Come on, you can do that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do that. And then uh, Glenn tells me yesterday, he says, well, uh, you know, Pastor Pete is going to be at church tomorrow. And I'm like, what? The founder, Pastor Pete, is going to be here at church. And I thought, well, thanks, Glenn. No pressure there. <laughs> then I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll bet after after today, Pastor Pete's going to say, okay, I, I got to come out of retirement. This this guy's not going to handle it. This guy is way in over his head. We love you, Jay. Come on. Right. Well, I need to officially be Pastor. Didn't mean to record him because I was trying to start us on time at 10:15. So, but then our clock is wrong back there. So if I get off off of time here, it's not totally my fault. Let's see. Uh, some of the other announcements going on is uh, I will not be here next week. Uh, next week we're having a uh, conglomeration. How would you say that? A conglomeration. What are we doing? What's have, the official what, title? Community, Wait for this. community service? That's like we're no. in trouble or something. No. Be community service. Right. No. <laughs> we have two other churches joining us next week, right? Two other churches joining us. And the, the elders from the other churches are going to share. Uh, the other worship team is going to be here doing things. And so it's just going to be a great time. I am not going to be here. Um, that's not the reason we scheduled that, this thing just kind of came up and filled in for me. Uh, I have the opportunity to go with my oldest brother. My oldest brother is a missionary electrician, and uh, he has a uh, trip to go to Mayfield, Kentucky, and there's another town near there that was destroyed by tornadoes last year, and so he's going to wire houses and things, and he asked me to go with him, and this is a long time ago, so yeah, I think I can go, you know. So I'm, I'm just pastoring one church now. So, anyway, uh, so I said yes a long time ago. Anyway, it, it, so I'm going to be gone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave uh, next Saturday, and then I'll be back the following Saturday. Saturday, I will be here for Mother's Day. We'll be here for Mother's Day. What's interesting about this whole uh, series of studies that God has kind of led, and, and this just confirms that God's been leading a lot of is because uh, I wasn't sure where to go after our study of Jonah. You know, we did our we did our study in Second Peter, right? Then we jumped back to the Old Testament and did Jonah. And then after Jonah, I thought, uh, Jonah, I liked your book, by the way. Good job. <laughs> and um, his name Jonah. If you're not sure what I'm doing, but um, after Jonah, it's like, well, what did I want to do? And then uh, I thought, well, I, I think I want to do something in the New Testament for sure. I want to do one of the Pauline epistles, and I wasn't sure which one. And then uh, just the story of Elijah came to mind, uh, mostly because a lot of times I um, get into uh, kind of a de depression, you know, and Elijah certainly had a time of depression in the cave there. And I thought, well, why don't we just go ahead and study Elijah, do a couple, three weeks on Elijah, and then I'll go do my mission strip, then when I get back, I'll do something else. 
And so what's interesting, this is fed right into where the Lord, I, I think the Lord is leading us to study First Timothy. And in studying First Timothy, we find that the Apostle Paul is mentoring, handing off the mantle, if you will, to, to Timothy, young Timothy. And so what better way than to set the whole thing up with Elijah handing off the mantle to Elisha. And so that's, that's where we're at today. We're going to talk about the mantle of Elijah. So let me uh, dial it up here and uh, maybe to help us a little bit. What if, what if Billy Graham called you like two weeks before he passed away? He calls you on the telephone and he says, I have been instructed by the Lord to hand off my ministry, what the Lord has given me, hand it off to you. I have a ticket waiting for you at DIA. You need to go to DIA. You need to get on a plane. You need to come out here to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Right? Charlotte, North Carolina. And we're going to go over a few things before I die. And it's going to be yours. This whole thing's going to be yours. What, what would you think about that? Shock, thing all over. I'd be like, no, I don't think so. I think you got the wrong phone number. I don't think so. I, I don't think I could do that. Uh, let me just run some numbers by you as far as the ministry of Billy Graham. And uh, if, if you haven't seen Billy Graham preach, uh, I used to, when I was a little kid, I lumped him in with all the other television evangelists, you know, Oral Roberts and all of that, you know. And then I saw him, and I thought, oh, this is what all the others are trying to be. Oh, I get it. And uh, so he is uh, a cut above, right? Billy Graham. And so um, estimated number of people who have heard Billy Graham preach. Any guesses? Estimated number of people who have heard him preach. Ten million. A billion. 2.2 billion. 2.2 billion. How, how many woke up this morning and said, you know, before I die? I want to preach or minister to 2.2 billion people. Anyway, he preached that. Now, estimated number of people that responded at the crusades. He held over 400 crusades. Some of the crusades went for months. He held over 400 crusades. Uh, the estimated number of people that uh, responded to the invitation at the end of the crusade, any guesses? 1 million. 2.2 million. 2.2 million physically came forward and responded. Uh, Billy Graham had the opportunity to meet with and pray with 13 U.S. presidents. From Harry Truman to Donald Trump, he met with and prayed with 13 U.S. presidents. Uh, he was married to Ruth for 63 years before she passed away in 2007. Uh, he, he received national notoriety uh, starting in 1949, uh, they they came into Los Angeles and they were there to do a crusade for three weeks. Guess how long the crusade went on for? Three Eight months. weeks. Eight weeks. It went on five weeks longer than they had planned. And um, and then in 1957, uh, they went into Madison Square Garden to do some nightly meetings. And guess how long those meetings continued for? They're in Madison Square Garden in New York City, 1957. Guess how long those meetings went on? Four months. Four months every night. I mean, I guess no basketball games or anything going on. Madison Square Garden, here you go, Billy Graham. Four months. Uh, one time, this is, this is unheard of today. Uh, one time, um, NBC offered Billy Graham $5 million to be on their network. Most television evangelists, they have to pay for airtime. You know, they have to pay for radio time, things like that. NBC offered him $5 million to be on their network, and he turned it down. Yep. He turned it down. He said, well, I'm, you know, I work for the Lord. I don't work for you guys. Uh, and then the reason I put this uh, photograph up here of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. In 1963, Billy Graham posted bail 
for Martin Luther King Jr. after he was arrested during the civil rights protests in Birmingham, Alabama. And I had the, we had the opportunity to go see Billy Graham when he was here in Denver. I don't know if anybody was in Denver in 1987. Were you here? I was here. We went and saw Billy Graham, and it was right after we found out we were pregnant with our first child, uh, Bethany, and uh, and we went to the Billy Graham crusade. I was just blown away. I think we our seats were way up top or whatever, and uh, and I don't know how many nights it went on for. It went on four or five nights at least. I was just blown away. Just such a blessing. And then what really impressed me, the next day when when they packed up and left, the next day the Billy Graham um, ministry. They took out a full-page ad in the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News. I missed the Rocky Mountain News, by the way. And uh, full-page ads. And they were telling, uh, in the full-page ad, they were telling how much money came in and exactly where it all went. Full-page ads for financial accountability. And I thought, wow, that is integrity, man. So Billy Graham calls you up a couple weeks before he passes away. And he says, hey, I'm going to hand off the ministry to you. It's like, oh well, boy, that'd be something. Well, the reason I dialed all that up, these are some of the feelings, I'm sure, that were cascading through Elisha. When Elijah shows up in his field and hands off his mantle to Elisha. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is the mantle of Elijah. So what is a mantle? Well, it's above a fireplace. Oh no. It's it's sort of a cloak. It's an outer garment. Uh, you could today you might call it a well some it depends who made it, but it can be used, could have been used as an overcoat, could be used as a blanket, it could be a blanket at night, an overcoat during the day. Um, Elijah in our, in our story last week, he wrapped himself in the mantle in shame when the Lord showed up with the still small voice, you know, and wrapped his face in the mantle. And so that's what this mantle is. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a cloak. It's an outer garment. And uh, in Elijah's case, this mantle symbolized God's anointing on him. It symbolized his authority. So just like we were talking about Billy Graham calling up to hand off the ministry to you, that would be Billy Graham handing off the mantle to you. And uh, now I am sure that Elijah, um, he, he shed many tears over his people, over the children of Israel. Israel had been in rebellion against the Lord for a long time. Um, he had witnessed to his nation, but here his nation was. They're turning away from the living God. Over and over they were chasing idols. Let's keep in mind that Elijah was a man who was losing his nation. Elijah was a man who was losing his nation. He was seeing people time after time forsaking the Lord, creating their own gods that would allow them to indulge their selfish desires. Does that sound familiar? Do, do you feel like you're a person in the United States that perhaps you, you feel like we're, we're losing our nation sometimes. You look around, you read some of the news feeds, and it's like, what is wrong with people? What is going on here? And we have people, uh, we see people, uh, even in our government, and many Americans, they're running after other gods to satisfy their fleshly desires. Even many churches there are many churches that have gotten on board with this, and they've actively, they've been actively trying to preach a different Jesus, preach a different gospel that would accommodate this adultery against the Lord, idolatry against the Lord. The Apostle Paul said this uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, Wow, there's going to be somebody coming along preaching a different Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Or if somebody 
If you receive a different spirit, small s, from the spirit, capital S, you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily, easily enough. The Apostle Paul is warning us not to do these things. This mantle that probably held many of Elijah's tears was going to be handed off to Elisha. And, and we're going to see that Elijah, um, well, and Elisha, they're going to use this mantle similar, similarly to, to the way Moses used his staff. You know, we see Moses parting the Red Sea with his staff. But here we're going to see uh, Elijah parts the Jordan River, and then Elisha comes back and parts it with this mantle. So let's read. We're in. Uh, we're going to pick it up where we left it off last week in First Kings nineteen, and we'll start in verse fifteen because I'd love to try to mispronounce these names. There's going to be a spelling test on these names later. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael, 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 as king over Syria, that guy. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and um, Elisha, or did I say king over Syria, and Israel, there we go, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Uh, so, you may recall that last week, Elijah was in this cave, he was having his little pity party, you know, and um, he, he was there on Mount Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai, so it's the same mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments, same mountain where he saw uh, the burning bush, and God shows up, God shows up and visits Elijah in this cave on Mount Sinai, and he shows up in a still, small voice. And then what I love about this whole thing, it's, it's like God just pulls up a rock, and he sits down, and he has a little business meeting with Elijah. And he's basically saying, well, if, if you're done with your pity party here, I, I'm going to put you back into, put you back to work here. And he says, okay, if you're done whining, go here, go there, anoint this guy, anoint that guy, and anoint Elisha to be your successor. And that's what Elijah does. He gets up and he wipes his tears and he gets on with the Lord's business. And I think it's worth noting here that Elijah was probably still in the throes of his melancholy. He was probably still feeling quite depressed. But he gets up and he obeys the Lord anyway. And I think that's one of the first lessons we should learn from this. There's... There, are times in your life, and maybe you've learned this already, there are times in your life that you're going to have to obey the Lord even if you don't feel like it. How many have done that? Maybe you got up this morning and said, I don't really feel like going to church and listen to that, listening to that Yahoo talk today. But you came anyway. And hopefully you're being blessed. But uh, a lot of times we need to let our obedience override our feelings. We may not feel like doing things, but we need to follow through with, with what the Lord has given you to do. If you have not experienced this yet in serving the Lord in his kingdom, you will. There will be times when you, you just, you're just going to have to follow through with what God has called you to do, even though you don't feel like it. But if you do obey, it's amazing how God revives you as you go, and you end up rejoicing that you got up and you obeyed the Lord when you felt like you were not going to make it, right? And so God uses service here to snap Elijah out of his self-pity. So he, Elijah, departed from there and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and turned a yoke, took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. And so, um, 
we might be thinking, what is going on with all these oxen? Why, are, why is the Bible reporting all these things about the, the yoke of oxen and things? And you might be thinking, what, what is a yoke? Well, a yoke goes something like this. A horse walks into the bar, and the bartender says, why the long face? Oh, no, that's a joke. It's not a yoke. You can probably go to uh, Cracker Barrel. There you go. Go to Cracker Barrel, look on the wall. There's probably a yoke up there. But what a yoke would do, it would tie two oxen together around their necks, tie together. And uh, did we even see any yokes yesterday? Did you guys, did you guys have any yokes at your... Uh... They, they have had them before. The yokes were pretty together, weren't they? Yeah, they were. Oh, what do you think it's called? Is it the tent? Yeah. Oh. Do they call that a yoke with the buckets on the inside? Oh. So you're treating your kids like oxen? <laughs> no, they volunteer. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> okay, so these oxen were tied together. Now, so it's giving you this, inf this information. Elisha was plowing um, in the field with, with other people. And there was 12 yoke of oxen behind this field. What does that mean? What is it? Who cares? Well, it indicates that Elisha's family was rich. That's what it indicates. It indicates that they needed 12 yokes of oxen to take care of this land. It would be quite a bit of land. And then it says that uh, Elisha, he was plowing with the 12th yoke of oxen. So he had two oxen and a, and a plow. And he was bringing up the rear, if you will. So this means one of two things. And this is what you get reading a whole bunch of commentaries. Uh, it means one of two things. I'm going to tell you what I think here in a minute. But uh, we're all here to know what I think. Right? The, uh, the first thing it could mean, it could mean that Elisha was the oldest of his family. He was the eldest of his family. And he was the supervisor. So he's supervising these other plowmen with their yokes of oxen. And so that is one possibility, that he's kind of the supervisor. He's bringing up the rear, keeping all these other guys in front of him, kind of a thing. The, others, the other idea, and I think this is the more likely situation, he's the youngest. He's the youngest of the family, and they don't really care about him. And they have him bringing up the rear. Just put Elisha in the last. Put him in the rear. He's the youngest. Let him have the 12th yoke of oxen, you know. And so I think I'm leaning more towards the latter because that is more in line with the character of God because God has always chosen the, the youngest. God chooses the, the youngest all the time, doesn't he? He, he chose uh, uh, in the family of Abraham. He chose Isaac over Ishmael. Uh, in the family of uh, Isaac, he chose Jacob over Esau. Jacob was younger than Esau, uh, just by a few minutes. And then in the family of Jacob, he chooses Joseph, who was the 11th son. Yeah. And so God seems to always, uh, he has a soft spot for the youngest. Are you the youngest in your family today? We got, I know we got Benjamin over here. But uh, yeah, God has a soft spot for the young. And I'm, I'm kind of glad, of, I'm the youngest in my family. And you must be, you're probably thinking, man, you got a lot of old people in your town. <laughs> but anyway, I'm always happy to hang around people that are older than me. But uh, yeah, so God has a soft spot for the younger. And so I think this is more in character of God that God chooses the last, He chooses the least, He chooses the most unlikely. And I think that's the case here that Elisha was plowing with the 12th yoke of oxen. Because they kind of wanted him out of the way. They wanted him to bring up the rear, kind of a deal. And so I think that's what's going on here. So Elijah comes onto their field, trespassing by the way, <laughs> comes onto the field, and he chooses the least, the most unlikely. And he puts his mantle on him. Probably anybody else who was watching this, they'd say, I can't believe he chose that guy. But isn't that the way God does? God always chooses the most unlikely. The reason I'm standing 
here right now because I was the most unlikely. Like he's thinking, well, there was somebody better than you? Probably. <laughs> they just didn't want to do it, I guess. Anyway, I love this verse. I, I quoted this verse often at the rescue mission. Uh, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God loves to use the least likely to accomplish his work. That way he gets all the glory. So Elijah comes in, passed by him, threw his mantle on him. Elijah placed this coat this mantle upon Elisha, and Elisha, he knew what it meant. It's interesting that Elisha, he knows immediately what this means. And I think that's why he ran after Elijah. Um, it had only been uh, two to three months since the showdown on Mount Carmel. Should we do our showdown? We're going to do our showdown. Showdown. The showdown on Mount Carmel. And the showdown on showdown on Mount Carmel uh, that was uh, where <laughs> uh, Elijah gathers, they gather all the people uh, a lot of people and uh, the 450 prophets of Baal and he tells all the people, the children of Israel and says how long will ye halt between two opinions if the Lord is God worship him if Baal is God worship him and so he made, a, he made a deal let's both take a bullock Cut it in pieces, put it on the altar. Who's ever God answers by fire, that that God is God. And the people said, okay, sounds good to us. And so he allows the prophets of Baal to go first, and nothing happens, right? Um, Elijah even stands back, he mocks them a little bit. And then, and then Elijah, Elijah comes up, and he repairs the altar, repairs the altar, and then he makes the sacrifice, and he calls upon the Lord. He calls upon the Lord, and he gives God all the glory, and God answers by fire, right? And consumes the sacrifice, the stones, laps up the water that they had poured on, and God shows up. And then all, the, it says, all the children of Israel, they bowed down, and they said, the Lord is God, the Lord, he is God. And that repentance only lasted a little while, but... Um, so this showdown was still fresh in the minds of Elisha and his brothers, and uh, it was still having a ripple effect in the land there. And so I'll bet when the kids, uh, when the kids would play, right? I think they would they would play and they would uh, uh, play. Hey, let's play Elijah on Mount Carmel. Who wants to be Elijah, right? And then they, they'd say, okay, who, who wants to be the 450 prophets of Baal? Oh, you're dead. You know? <laughs> I'm just saying that the fame of the Mount Carmel showdown, showdown was rippling through the land, and that's the reason, one of the reasons, that Elisha knew what this meant, having the mantle on his shoulders. Uh, I'm sure just about every true Israelite Every true children of Israel, child of Israel, they were thinking, I want to be utilized by God in the next big display of God showing up, you know. And so here's Elijah. He puts the man, mantle on him. And Elisha, he knows what this means. And then, uh, and he left the oxen. He ran after Elijah. And said, please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I to, done to you? And uh, this seems like a kind of a weird, cold exchange here, doesn't it, from Elijah? Elijah's kind of prickly, <laughs> right? Go back. What have I done to you? Who needs you? Kind of a deal. But what we're going to find out is that... Uh, Elijah does this, uh, we're going to read uh, three more times, he does something similar. And Elijah seems to uh, set Elisha up uh, to test him. 
So there's statements that he makes to test him. And I think this is part of it. Uh, you can actually say, I don't know if you've done any seminars on motivational interviewing. How many have been forced <laughs> to go to seminars on motivational interviewing? Just me? I'm not going to give you a seminar on motivational interviewing. But it, here, in a way, <laughs> Elijah is the first motivational inter interviewing guy. He's the first MI guy ever. But uh, this exchange it, uh, reminds me of a conversation that Jesus had with a potential follower in Matthew chapter 8. Um, Matthew chapter 8, the teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have, have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go, first let me. That's, that's not a good way to start a prayer with the Lord. Lord, first let me. First let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the, bed, let the dead bury their own dead. Now, you might be thinking, boy, Jesus is kind of harsh with this guy. Jesus is kind of prickly, dude. What is going on here? Well, most uh, scholars agree, and I agree with this, uh, what this guy was really saying, he was saying, hey, let me wait until my parents die, and uh, then I will bury them. Then I will collect my inheritance. Then I'll be uh, independently wealthy, and then I'll come follow you. That's what he's saying. And Jesus just encourages him to serve in God's kingdom even when there is no guarantee of material needs being met. So that's what Jesus is doing here. And so Elijah says, uh, go back again for what have I done to you? It's a test. And Elisha, he passes the test. How do we know he passed the test? Well, he goes and he takes the, the yoke of oxen, the two oxen that he had been plowing with, and he slaughters them, and then he uses his plow, he breaks it up and uses it as firewood to make a sacrifice of these oxen unto the Lord. And, uh, man, you talk about burning your bridges. This guy, Elisha, was saying, I am not coming back. I am not coming back to this field. I am not coming back to this job. Now, maybe you've had jobs like that. You wish you could have just... I'm not encouraging you. You know, my pastor this last Sunday told me just yelling to burn this place down. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Don't, don't do that. Don't misquote me on that. But here, Elisha, basically, I think he's saying, I am leaving everything, and I am following God's call on my life. I am making it impossible for myself to return to my former way of life. That's what Elisha is doing here. He's making it impossible for himself to return to his former way of life. Following God's call, I think Elisha was thinking this, following God's call is plan A, and there is no plan B. Following God's calling in my life is plan A, there is no plan B. And so, and then what's cool about Elisha, he, Serves, serves up the uh, sacrificed animals as a barbecue to his town. Right? I, I wonder if some people are eating the barbecue and they're thinking, oh, I'm so glad Elisha got called into the ministry. He serves good barbecue. I hope somebody gets called into ministry tomorrow. I love this barbecue. So if God's truly calling you into barbecue, you're going to if God's truly calling you into the ministry, you're going to have a barbecue. So that's what we learned from this. That's a stretch. Okay, now we're going to pick up the completion of the passing of the mantle. We're going to skip ahead a few chapters. So we were in 1 Kings chapter 19. Now we're skipping up to 2 Kings chapter 2. And let's read it here. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Uh, see what I mean by Elijah's training method here? I think he makes statements towards Elisha, testing him. 
Hey, I just want you to stay here. Just, just sit over there. I want you to stay here. And Elisha says, no way. I'm not going to stay here. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite words in the uh, construction business is uh, the word apprentice. I've always loved that word, apprentice, the idea of it. You know, I, I'm not sure if I would make a very good apprentice. And, uh, but the idea uh, of learning, having a learning environment that would be hands-on, that's what an apprentice would do, right? Uh, I could, if I was an apprentice, I could watch someone do something, and then they would watch me try to do it. And I'd probably do it wrong, and they'd tear it apart and make me do it again. But that's an apprentice. Right? In construction, an, an apprentice usually follows a journeyman around or a master, master carpenter, uh, or master plumber. Harry, we'll move on to the master plumber over here. Follow him around, and he would watch him, and he would learn, and then he would repeat whatever the journeyman was doing or the master was doing. Uh, it's hands-on training. I, I think this is much better than trying to grasp concepts in a classroom setting. I've always been more of a kinesthetic learner. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the best student, you know? I'm not the best classroom guy. Cindy knows that she's a teacher. And, uh, but I, I like learning hands-on, but uh, my wife, she spends most of her lesson planning trying to help uh, her students apply things. And so trying to get it to be kinesthetic, you know? And so, uh, it takes learning out of the classroom. It takes learning out of theory, and it places it in reality. I love this. Basically, Elisha is saying here, no way, Jack, or no way, Elijah. I am your apprentice, and I have got to watch everything you do closely, so I ain't going nowhere. Now, the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha, and they said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. This term, the sons of the prophets, in some Bibles it will say the company of the prophets. And these are students. These are students. And what Elijah is doing here, at that time there were uh, three schools of the prophets. Uh, today, we, we, might, we might call them Bible colleges or seminaries, but at that time, there was one in Gilgal, there was one in Bethel, and there was one in Jericho. And so, what Elijah is probably doing, he's making his final tour to these seminaries. He's making his final tour to these schools of the prophets. And uh, maybe, he, it's, maybe he's giving a lecture saying... Hey, just so you know, I'm out of here today. So he might be saying that, but I don't think he's saying that. I think he's just checking on these schools. And, uh, and then these, these sons of the prophets, or this company of prophets, apparently they, uh, along with Elisha, are already functioning in the gift of prophecy. They're functioning in that gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is when the Holy Spirit gives you information that perhaps... Not a whole lot of people know, but he gives it to you ahead of time, so he, you know what's going on. Now, I do believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit for today. I do believe that God still functions like that, and he wants to uh, baptize all of us in the Holy Spirit, and he wants these gifts to come out. And so, at the end of service today, I would like to line everybody up and slap you on the forehead. That would... Maybe just slap you upside the head. Would that help? Look at yourself. No, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, but I do believe in the gifts, the workings, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. I think uh, one of the reasons we don't see it a whole lot in the church in the United States is probably because of the abuse of it. Not because of the use of it, but the abuse of it. And so, but here these guys are functioning in the gift of the Holy Spirit of prophecy, and they knew that this was the day that Elijah was going to be taken away from Elisha. And it sounds like Elijah didn't want to hear it. It's like, no, man, I don't want to lose my, my mentor. Now, just in case you're wondering how long, 
How long had Elisha been following Elijah around? How long had uh, Elisha been the apprentice of Elijah? How many guesses? What kind of guess? I mean, keep in mind, we went from 1 Kings 19. There's some significant things that happen in those three or four chapters there. And then we get up to 2 Kings chapter 2. How long do you think Elisha hung with Elijah? Any guesses? What? Three years. 20 years? Oh, no, no, that's... 10 years? Three. I'm getting closer. Yeah. You guys are pretty good. Did you Eight read my years? commentaries? <laughs> well, most commentaries believe it's uh, at least six years. At least six years. They could have been on their seventh year here. And the way they go by that, they, <laughs> they actually go by the, the date of Ahab's death. Uh, Ahab gets killed and he actually kills himself. And then uh, Elijah uh, and then Jezebel gets thrown out of the window. Splatters the dogs eat her. <laughs> Don't be a Jezebel. Don't be an Ahab. Anyway, my wife didn't want me to mention that. <laughs> Don't mention that to the kids. All right, I'll have to PG it. Let me remind you. You got to PG it a little bit. And so, anyway, there's a lot of things that happen. So this uh, Elisha had been following Elijah at least six years. This uh, was probably the seventh year. And then I do have a commentary. Warren Rusby thinks it's about 10 years. That's a long time. That's a long time to follow somebody around <coughs> and not be given the reins. Right? I, don't, I don't think I would follow Harry around <laughs> showing me how to install toilets and things and whatever else. You know, I mean, I, I would say, you know, within that same day, I want to try. <laughs> and he'd probably want me to. And then they'd have to tear it out, and we'd have to start all over. Maybe go get an interesting toilet, too. Anyway, and so they were together at least six or seven years, and these sons of the prophets, they have the prophecy going on, and maybe Elisha just didn't want to hear it. I don't want to lose my mentor today. and uh, But they both knew it. So they had this interchange. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of prophecy is working. Verse 4, then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. That's where another school is. Uh, but he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. He says it again, right? So they came to Jericho, where the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you, over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to them, stay here, stay, said to him, sorry, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And, and so I think we're seeing some motivational interviewing here going on. Elisha is tested at least three times here, but he sticks with Elijah. He doesn't let him out of his sight. And... Uh, we already talked about how long he had been following him around. So here they are at the Jordan. And, uh, and then verse 7 goes on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle. Uh, this, is, this is Elijah's actual mantle. <laughs> a lot of you guys have found it at the Arctic. It was at a museum <laughs> over in Jerusalem. Sure. <laughs> they loaned it to me just for today. So Elijah comes up to the Jordan River. What does he do? You ready? That's what he does. And the water parts. We're going to get to do this later. Our children's lessons. <laughs> the hard part is going to be keeping the kids from hitting each other. You're not parting your that. brother. I thought about using this, but I don't know. That's, that's kind of girly. Job. Is that a king's rope? Is that what that is? Okay. Uh, fine. I think it's one Mason. So uh, Elijah takes the mantle, he rolls it up, strikes the water, it divides. So that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. What's interesting about this, there's a lot of interesting things about this, but uh, where are they headed? They are headed out of Israel. They're headed out, they're headed away from Israel and Judah. 
Could it be that um, they're going to the other side of the Jordan because um, Elijah has spent so many tears on the people of Israel? And he says, I'm done. I wonder if that's what's going on. But they crossed the Jordan, and uh, we know that Joshua, he did a similar thing, right? That he parted the Jordan River for the children of Israel to come in to uh, Israel, right? To come into uh, what was the land of Canaan at the time. It was the promised land. And uh, I just love the way the Lord repeats miracles. How many would love for the Lord just to repeat a bunch of miracles in our day. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, I've been thinking about this verse a lot, and this is from the NIV, this is Habakkuk 3.2, it says, Lord, I have heard of your fame, we're reading about some of that today, I've heard of your fame, I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord, repeat them in our day, in our time make them known, in wrath remember mercy. And I said it last week, the Lord does not owe us in the United States, he does not owe us another great awakening, another Jesus movement. He doesn't owe that to us. But wouldn't it be great if he did that? Wouldn't it be great if uh, uh, we started having some meetings somewhere and we thought, well, these are going to just go for a couple of nights and they end up going for four months? Wouldn't that be great? And the Lord is good like that. He's gracious like that. And so I think this is a legitimate prayer. Lord, renew them on our day. Don't part these waters. Come and do that cool stuff we read about. It would be so gracious of the Lord to bless our nation one more time, wouldn't it? Verse 9, and so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask what may I do for you before I am taken away from you. Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And I think um, this is another reason that leads me to believe that Elisha was the youngest in the family because the eldest in the family would get a double portion of an inheritance. Elisha is figuring, hey, I'm your only son here. I should get a double portion of this. And, uh, and we'll talk about this in a second. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be. So I think Elisha was the youngest of the family. The oldest would get the blessing. And I think Elisha is telling Elijah, I want you to treat me like your firstborn. Leave a double portion of your inheritance to me. And Elijah says, you have asked a hard thing. I think the reason... One of the reasons Elijah says that is because it's not his to give. Keep in mind that God started this whole thing with the anointing, right? He meets with Elijah in that cave back in 1 Kings 19, and he says, I want you to go down and anoint Elisha as your successor. And so God is the one who started this whole thing, and the mantle was the symbol of the anointing, and Elijah is saying here, it's not for me to give. Only God can give you a ministry. Only God can give you a spiritual mantle. Now, he might use a human being to bring it through, but you've got to be careful. There was, a, <laughs> there was a movement a few years ago called the Shepherd Movement. How many were around during that time? And uh, there's, this, there's another cult going on today called the, uh, the NAR Movement. Uh, what's it stand for? New Apostolic Reformation. Is that what it is? Oh, New Apostolic Reformation. And they, they have apostles. Apostles, and they will tell you what to do. Right? And so these human beings are telling other human beings, hey, this is your calling, that kind of a thing. You got to be careful of stuff like that. Elijah was careful of it. He says, this is a hard thing. But if you see me when I'm taken up, it'll be yours. But Elijah knew it wasn't his to give. It's the Lord's anointing. Now, perhaps Elisha was thinking when he asked for the double portion. He was thinking, I want double the power. I want double the miracles. And Elisha did do a lot of miracles. He did a lot. And there was a lot of powerful things that Elisha did that mirrored Elijah and went beyond Elijah. But maybe Elijah may have been hesitant here as well. Elijah was probably thinking about all the tears that his mantle had 
soaked up, right? Think about all the tears that had gone into this mantle. And perhaps Elijah was thinking, well, if you want to double the inheritance, yeah, you get double the miracles, double the power, but you're going to get double the heartaches too. You're going to get double the tears. Double the heartbreaks. It makes me think of the prayer of uh, William Booth. William Booth is the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, uh, one of his famous prayers, he said, Lord, let my heart break for the things that break your heart. So if you're asking for something from the Lord, a ministry from the Lord, be prepared that he's going to break your heart about something. And that's probably how he's going to motivate you to go meet that need. Then it happened... As they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Now, we know that... Uh, Elijah had put the mantle on Elisha, not sure when he took the mantle back, or it could have been that same day when uh, Elijah runs after him and says, hey, let me go kiss my mother and father, and maybe Elijah just takes the mantle off again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, somehow, the mantle ends up back in Elijah's hands, and but it drops from the chariot of fire. It drops down, and uh, this is so cool. Yeah. Then he took, uh, Elisha took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, struck the water, and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Now, you might be thinking, what is he in doubt here? I think what Elisha is doing here, he's saying, hey, I want to confirm that the Lord has anointed me to take over. So let's see if I can do this. Should I do it again? Should I do it before? No, we'll, we'll do it live. And so he does it. He rolls up that mantle and he strikes the uh, Jordan. And he struck the water and it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets, the students who were from Jericho, they saw him. And they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And that's our memory verse today. The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed down to the ground before him. Now, there are only two people in Scripture that went to heaven without dying. Elijah is one of them. Can anybody name the other? Enoch. Enoch! Way back in Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, it said, Enoch walked with God. He walked with God. It sounds like he took walks with the Lord all the time. And he was not, for the Lord took him. So maybe if you want to be translated early, you want to go to heaven without dying, maybe just take walks every day with the Lord. And the next time that we see Elijah, what's the next time we see Elijah in the scriptures? With Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah, that's the next time we see him. Uh, does anybody know what the name Elijah means? Elijah. It means the Lord, the Lord is my God. That's what it means. The Lord is my God. Uh, any guesses as to what the name Elisha meant, means? Eli, you know the Lord. It means the Lord is salvation. It's kind of interesting. So here, Elijah, uh, yeah, and you, you know that the name Jesus uh, the name Jesus is the Greek version of the name Yoshua or Joshua, and it means God is our salvation. Interesting, Elisha and Joshua, similar meanings. And just as Elijah confirmed Elisha's ministry, so did John the Baptist in the spirit and power of Elijah. He confirmed Jesus' ministry, didn't he? And both of these happened at the Jordan River. Isn't that interesting? Elijah's mantle, it fell from the chariot of fire as he was carried away into heaven. Elisha takes it up, and he starts performing miracles right away. The students and the sons of the prophets, they recognized 
the anointing on Elisha. Has anyone ever done that with you? They recognize that, hey, God, God has something on you. There, there are kids in this congregation that I've recognized that they have a calling on their life. I've recognized uh, things. I, I can call it out if you want. Uh, I've, uh, a few times I've had little conversations with Lydia back here. Uh, I think she is destined to run an orphanage in a foreign country. I think that's what her destiny is. You know, and, and it's not like I got a big vision or chariot of fire coming down. I just think that's probably what's going on. I have a few words for you guys as well. But uh, God has plans. And so um, he starts performing miracles, and the sons of the prophets, they recognize God's authority. On Elijah. If you ever want to do an interesting study in the Bible sometime, do a study on the word authority. Everywhere the word authority is, just kind of write down what it's in reference to. Especially the authority that God has given you as a believer in Christ. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations. So here's the conclusion, and you're probably saying, whew. You know, this guy has everything he's going to get there. So, what mantle has been given to you? What mantle has been given to you? And I would say that there's a spiritual mantle, and that's what we've, we've been talking about this whole time, a spiritual mantle. Um, and certainly, uh, this is going to lead right into our study uh, when I get back from uh, this uh, uh, getting in the way of all the construction workers in Kentucky. <laughs> I can at least serve as a bad example. That's my, that's yeah. my goal. So, uh, but certainly I, I do want to get to the point where we're talking about the Apostle Paul mentoring or handing off the mantle to uh, Timothy. Uh, now, so there's a spiritual mantle, but I, I think there's a family mantle as well. And one of the reasons I was excited about pastoring this church was, uh, you know, this church was formed by homeschoolers, which uh, parents being involved is a big deal. <laughs> and so it was just such a, and, and we were homeschoolers for a long time, and well, probably mostly my wife, yeah. you know, I, I was, the, I think I had to sign something every now and then that said I was the principal. Yeah. And it's like, I'm sure my wife was just. You're not the best. You're just taking up space. Anyway, but uh, but there's a spiritual mantle and there's a family mantle. I, I would say, let me just talk about my dad for a minute. Uh, my dad passed a family mantle to me. My dad showed me how to work hard for the ones that I love. That's part of his mantle that he gave me. My dad built his house. And I built my house. And my dad actually helped me build my house. It was uh, a lot of things in my house remind me of him. My dad stayed married for many years. Him and my mom were married uh, up until uh, his death. Uh, I've been married for many years, and my wife has assured me that if I ever leave her, I leave her, I'm going to die. <laughs> I've had other mentors in my life. If you want to move into a spiritual realm, I've had other mentors in my life uh, that I watched and I tried to emulate. Uh, there was a chaplain at the Denver Rescue Mission when I first started there in 1995. His name was Chaplain Biddle. And he was a man that, that cared deeply for people. He was an older guy. Uh, he was gentle and he was funny. And he knew the scriptures so well. He, was, he could apply the scriptures just so easily to every situation. And some, some of the guys he was talking to, they wouldn't even know that he was applying scripture to their life. I would know. I'd be like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. And uh, the study of Elijah is not, it didn't just happen. It wasn't just my idea. The studying of Elijah, the handing off the mantle uh, to Elisha, it really came about by the Lord's leading. This study sets up 
sets us up for the study I want to launch into when I get back. Uh, we're studying 1 Timothy, and, uh, you know, just as Elijah handed off the mantle to Elisha, Paul the Apostle hands off the mantle to Timothy. Um, you've probably heard this before if you've been involved in any of the Promise Keepers events. There was a Promise Keepers event where this started many years ago, but it was taught uh, that every man needs three men in their life. Every man needs three men in their life. Every man needs a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. Every man needs someone older, mentoring and training them like Paul. Every man needs a younger person like Timothy that they can uh, breathe life into. And we also, every man needs a Barnabas. They need someone their own age that encourages them. Now, I, I know we live in a time where involved fathers are rare, right? Have you heard that our society has been called the fatherless society? How many have heard that? We've been called the fatherless society. We've been called the fatherless generation. And there may be many that will listen to this on our website or whatever, and they're saying, well, you know, this doesn't really help me because my I never had a mentor. And maybe they're at the point where they're thinking, I'm never going to have a mentor. No one ever breathed into me. No one ever fed into me. And maybe this is a good time to look for someone to feed into. And so I think we have, uh, well, let me just say, say it like this. I believe Satan has done a great job taking dads out of the homes, taking dads away from their sons. Satan has done a great job of taking moms away from their daughters. Satan has flooded us with distractions. Uh, even if uh, parents are in the home, they're usually so busy. <laughs> they might be in proximity, in proximity, but they're really not there. They're there, but they're not there. I think one of the best things about this study is that, you know, how Elisha responds. When Elijah says, I want you to stay here, and Elisha says, no way. Where are you as my soul lives, as the Lord lives and as my soul lives, I will not leave you. And so he was there. Uh, one of the best books I ever read was a book by Larry Crabb. It's entitled Connecting. And it was one of my first experiences, exposures to what it meant to be present with someone. Uh, when you're talking to somebody, to be totally there, to be all there when somebody's talking to you, to not just nod and think so uh, so I was a chaplain and a counselor for many years at the mission. And there would be times I would come home and uh, my wife would start talking to me. And she, she knew immediately if I was in the chaplain mode or the counselor mode. You know, just kind of nodding my head, you know, that kind of thing. And she'd say, you're not listening to me. <laughs> you're, you're here, but you're not here. So I think that's something we can practice today. Can I be present? when people are talking to me. But maybe you're thinking, maybe you're older now, if you're listening to this, do you think, well, I never had anybody, I never had anybody to give me a mantle. What am I gonna do? What if no one has ever given me a mantle? I just wanna leave you with these encouragements that God himself will take you up. God himself has a robe for you. He has a mantle for you. He has a calling for you. And I, I guess I think of uh, Psalm 27. Even if, even when my mother and father forsake me, yet, Lord, you will take me up. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you never had an earthly father, an earthly mentor, someone to hand you a mantle, but I'm here to tell you that God the Father wants to give you a mantle. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to give you a mantle, and this is just a few scriptures as examples here. Isaiah 61 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Is that good news? And then a few verses before this, it says, the garment of praise. He has given me a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. One of the reasons I love to do worship, I was so happy to volunteer to do the worship today because, uh, uh, you know, you guys were doing all the music for the uh, uh, Living History Days. And so I thought, hey man, this would be cool. I'm going to be able to do worship and the Word. 
I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing me by now. But anyway, he's given me a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Uh, Jesus, because of his sacrifice and because of him sending the Holy Spirit, he has clothed us. I'll just give you a few examples. You can look up some of these others, some others on your own. But he has clothed us with power. He has clothed us with immortality. The Lord Jesus has clothed us through the power of his Holy Spirit. He's clothed us with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And these are just a few things. These are just a few mantles that the Lord has put on you if you were born again here today. If you're not born again, then I guess I need to slap you on the forehead. No. No. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to get ready for communion. I want to do communion, and then we're going to do the kids' lesson. Right? Okay. Let's, let's do that. We're going to get ready for communion. And uh, I do want to sing, as a response to this message, um, asking the Lord to just go ahead and put his mantle on us. And maybe you need to say that today. You need to say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to receive Whatever you want to clothe me in, Lord, whatever spiritual mantle you want to give me. Maybe the thing that I was hoping to get from an earthly father never got, Lord, I just received it from you right now. Maybe you need to feel that hand of God on your shoulder, feel him clothing you, and just receive what he has for you. And it doesn't matter how old you are. I'm reminded that uh, Moses was 80. <laughs> When he was in front of the burning bush. I don't think anybody's 80 anymore. I mean, who's the closest? I don't know. Uh, Gene, come on. Let's do... Uh, uh, I, do I, do. <laughs> I didn't say it. I want the oldest person. <laughs> no, uh, let's do uh, Take My Life and Let It Be. I think it's in your hymnal. And then we're going to do... Uh, can you... I gotta go over here now. And uh, I was telling the kids earlier, I needed two hats. I need like a worship hat and a preacher hat. Mm -hmm. no? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's all stand and sing this. Then we're gonna flow right into communion. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise.
The same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. It always blows me away that even though Jesus was in the throes of feeling betrayed, he still followed through with his Father's will. And I think that's another lesson of obedience beyond emotion. Even if you don't feel like it, you've got to follow through with what God's called you to do. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the Lord. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Lord, we just want to thank you so much for your sacrifice, Lord. We do not take it lightly. We thank you so much for following through with the cross. You sweated great drops of blood in the garden because you didn't feel like going to the cross. But in the book of Hebrews, it says that it was for the joy that was set before you that you endured the cross. We were the joy set before you, and you endured the cross for us. You didn't feel like it, but you followed through. I pray that you help us, Lord, in our service to you, that the days we don't feel like doing it, that we do it anyway. So bless us, Lord, with that fortitude and that persistence and that consistence. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. 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 All right, kids. Do we want them over here? Do we want them back here? Where do we want them? We'll, we'll, we'll start you right here, but I think we're going to have to move back there. Oh, yeah. 